Welcome to Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today I am delighted not only to be joined by Colin Watt, uh, but also former Celt, Simon Donnelly. Welcome to the show, Simon, how you doing? How you doing guys, you alright? Oh, it's great. It's great to see you, actually. I mean, um, we saw you back and forth up at Celtic Park. Obviously, you do a bit of work up at the park, Simon, but we've not been there since March. I mean, how's it been affecting even people like yourself? How's it been affecting you missing the football? Yeah, listen, just like every other fan, uh, missing it hugely. You know, I did. I think I did the last home game. I think it might have been St Mirren, the last game with fans at, for Celtic TV. Yeah, and never did I think, I think I was getting lined up to go to Ibrox for the for the Rangers game for Celtic TV, and never did I think this was going to happen. Even though we were aware of it at the time, I, I didn't see it going to this extent. So, surreal times uh, through lockdown, some difficult times for everybody. You know, I've had the, the boys off school. My wife's worked right through. Uh, but my own side, you know, in terms of work, it's it's been difficult. You know. Tri- we, we've got events and I was saying to you just before we came on air there that obviously they've all been stopped everything's been cancelled we, we had a big weekend planned in, in Spain in March yeah. and we had, we had mm-hmm. the 10x players lined up we had loads of people coming over music we were going to build it around I think the St Johnston game pool parties a lot you know just like in a, a mini convention and that get pulled at the 11th hour so difficult times for everybody Oh, absolutely! I, I seen the lineup, and it looked. I mean, you had Bobby Petal on the decks and everything, Bobby Simon. Petal. It looked like a <laughs> it looked like a cracking weekend. But that followed a a number of fantastic events that you had been um, hosting. I mean, Henrik Larson, Kenny Dalglish. It was it was tremendous. You were on a really really good run, and then it must be so frustrating, Simon, that it all just hits a brick wall as it has done over the last few months but I'm guessing that you've got plans maybe for next year to, to pick up where you left off Yeah well we've got the hydro gig with uh, Henrik, Chris and John uh, plus other guests Martin O'Neill is on board for that one as well so that that's going to be a really good night but again that was meant to be in May it got booked back to August it's now we've got a date in February for that but realistically we might have to put that back to next summer, you know, just uh, to guarantee that it goes ahead. You know, we've, we've sold a lot of tickets. There's still tickets on sale. But I think to, to be safe, uh, I think we'll probably have to put that back. We'll take guidance off the hydro. But as I say, when that comes round, that'll be, a, that'll be a great night. I was thoroughly looking forward to it. You know, the three boys on stage, between them, Three gold machines for Celtic over the years. Fantastic players to get Martin O'Neill's view on it. It will be a good night. Oh, what a lineup, Colin! I mean, you're a, a much younger man than me, but that that really is a golden era. That's obviously came after <clears throat> Simon's era, but that that was you growing up as a Celtic fan, was it not? Definitely. I mean, um, Henrik Larsson was like my hero growing up. I, I went out to the park at the weekends and I wanted to be Henrik Larson. And uh, obviously coming through, stopping the 10, Simon being a big part of that. I, I don't know, maybe there was others across the country that wanted to be the next Simon Donnelly, but I wanted to be the next <laughs> Henrik Larson. Yeah, I don't um, blame you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, it sounds like an incredible night. And um, obviously you're saying, Simon, that it might move to next summer. There's obviously a big party planned for next summer. Ten in a yeah. row, potentially. Scotland it, qualifying for the Euros. Yeah, it could be, an it could be a great summer. As I say, we never, we didn't plan it that way at all. As I say, I, I was really looking forward to having this in May. But just with circumstances and stuff. But again, as you say there, it, it might prove to be a fantastic time for everybody connected with the club and the country. And, you know, that show will be a fantastic evening. Oh, definitely. Now, 
One of the big things, Simon, the reason that we're doing live broadcast is we've had to adapt during the, the the lockdown and everything that's happened over the last few months. So we found ourselves doing live broadcast. Everybody seems to be adapting what they're doing day to day. And another uh, way that you've adapted um, as a promotions company is you have launched some very special gin. I've got a bottle of it here. This is Frank Macaveni. This bottle actually is signed by Maca. Yeah. And Colin is modelling Chris Sutton. Now, talk to us about this. I know I'm not a big drinker, but I know that gin is in vogue. It's one of these ones, all my mates are drinking gin. And, you know, I just think that what you've done there is, you know, to actually pick out two brilliant number nines, but a few other selts, Simon. Tell me how you went about it. How did you decide on the flavours? How did you put all this together? Listen, it was just to be creative in these times, you know, and have a bit of fun with it. We worked in conjunction with a, a distiller in our growth. Uh, we got our heads together and uh, what players are we going to come up with to do this? And we, we spoke to the four boys who were, were, were delighted to get on board with it. We did a, a gin testing Zoom night, obviously, during lockdown, which became quite a messy one but quite enjoyable. But Did you record it, Simon? Did you record any no, of that footage? Just, no, <laughs> There's no way that footage that. would go. Not record that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they're good tasting gins. Uh, the distiller has won awards in the, in the past for these gins, and it was important for us, as I say, not to just use the boys' names as a gimmick, you know, when you go and buy one bottle and it's rubbish. We wanted good product, so I think you'll find the, 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 the top draw gins that, you know, once somebody has a drink of it, they'll hopefully want another bottle. But the the boys are on board with it. We're, we're having a wee bit of fun this week. We're, we're doing a wee video promo this week uh, that will hopefully air at the weekend uh, on social media. But yeah, the boys have got on board with it. And as I say, it's just been creative in these times, these difficult times, what we can do with, with, with things. So hopefully with Christmas coming up, it will prove to be a, a nice gift for people. Oh, definitely. Another thing that you have moved into yourself, Simon, um, is the Huddle podcast that I was watching. Uh, I was actually watching on YouTube uh, because obviously it's been filmed in the studio as well. So talk yeah. to us about that. We've had yourself, Marka and Mark Wilson all at different times on the podcast over the years. Uh, yeah. Mark Wilson seems to be a bit of a natural presenter, does he not? Yeah, we, we, we asked Mark to, to host it. Uh, and he's, he's taken it really well, I think. You know, the, I think we've did five episodes now and he's he's controlled it really well, I think, you know, and we've varied it up with myself and Mark and Murdo, different eras of playing at Celtic, you know, so different views on the game, uh, different stories to tell, and we've managed to get some good guests on. You know, we had Lubo the first week, Big Johan Mialby's been on, we had Paddy McCourt yesterday, uh, I think that one went on here this morning at 7 o'clock, so Paddy been. I don't think it's Celtic, you know, the, the style that he played, I think. Paddy sometimes plays himself down, uh, but he's a, a huge, hugely popular figure amongst the Celtic fans just for his his style of play. So we've had some good guests, and yeah, hopefully we just we grow it. You know, it's something new for, for all of us. You, obviously, you guys are more experienced at this, and you're further down the line doing it daily and stuff, but it's something that we've, we've quite enjoyed, you know, so we'll see where we go with it. Oh, brilliant. Now, you can find that on YouTube. Uh, you mentioned Lubo and Mialbe. That's the other two guys who are on the gin bottles, isn't it, Simon? Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. And so, a bit you know, of fun some... with the boys. You know, we did a couple of videos. I think Lubo's found it a wee bit more difficult to do the videos than, than the rest, which is understandable. I mean, his English is good, but it's not perfect. Uh, Johan, I think, if you, if you look at Johan, he's kind of sending himself up a wee bit in the, in the videos. You know, he's had a lot of fun with it. Uh, I think he's taken it a wee bit more naturally than, than Lou in terms of performing to the camera rather than performing on the, on the pitch. Oh, brilliant. No, we look forward to seeing how that progresses and how the huddle progresses as well. Simon, it's been a strange old season uh, for obvious reasons, obviously, with regards to COVID. But Colin and I uh, and the rest of the team have been covering every nuance of Celtic, good, bad and ugly. And it seems to be quite an unexpected uh, turn of events, really, with, with the form. I mean, what, what do you mainly put that down to yourself, Simon? I know you're an avid follower of the game. You've, you've been watching Celtic like the rest of us. Or do you think it's... Uh, 
you know, something that we can get over. And maybe even during the international break, uh, we've maybe been able to work with the guys, you know, that have been left back at home. And we can go again against uh, Hibs and try and build some kind of momentum. To answer your question, I certainly think it's something we can go over. The boys have been over that course the last few years and, and show they've got the they've got the metal there to handle that, uh, the mindset to handle it, and the ability, obviously. Uh, I think the start to the season could be a combination of <laughs> loads of things. So no fans there for a start. This whole COVID thing hanging over everybody's head. Players going away on international duty and then having to isolate when they come back. Injuries. You know, it's a, a, a whole combination of things uh, that are probably the reason why Celtic haven't found their top form. Now, having said that, at one stage we were still getting results, but again, we know we can perform better and we're, we're, we're greedy if we want the, the good performances. Uh, so I think that'll, that'll turn, you know, and I think even your point there on the guys that were left behind, I think guys are away. I think like, Ryan Christie's playing at the top of his game. You know, he's yeah. excelling there for Scotland, and I think that lift from the qualifications will bring him back on cloud nine. Callum McGregor had a fantastic game against Serbia as well, so I think that could work for Lee Griffiths, for example, got a bit of game time as well. That's probably yeah. what Griff, Griff needs. So I think that will reflect well. Edward, there's another one, scores a couple of goals for the under-21. So I think these guys will come back, you know, and I think Celtic will go on a run. I thought they were going to do it after Lille in the semi-final and then they the set back against Sparta Prague. They bounced back well against Muddle just before the international uh, break, which Lenny probably would have wanted on the back of that result. But I think Celtic will be ready uh, to go on a run now and really start motoring like they've done the last two seasons. You know, we, we had a spell there before Christmas last year and then get beat at the turn of the year off Rangers and then motor motor off again, you know, after the winter break. So I fully expect them to get on a run pretty sharpish. You know, when you look back, Simon, to the days of yourselves stopping the 10, a lot of Celtic fans like to call it uh, winning the one rather than stopping the 10. But that season and the pressures around uh, obviously stopping the 10 as it was, um, a whole decade of dominance by the other side of the city. I mean, when you're, for example, travelling away on international duty, does it does it ever enter your mind that it's almost a distraction? I mean, I know Scotland have done so well this week and it's re-engaged a lot of fans who may, maybe felt a wee bit disillusioned and disenchanted with international football, Simon. But you think of players like Griffin, you think, brilliant, he's got the minutes in his legs, Ryan Christie's flying, Eduard maybe hasn't started greatly for Celtic, but perhaps he's going to get a wee injection um, of momentum by doing doing well for France I mean yeah. for, like yourself you're travelling away for Scotland you're coming back to Celtic if you've had a good game did you feel yourself that that would help your club football as well? Aye I think so I think it's a, a national pride I, I get what you're saying about the. I've been guilty of myself in, over the last few period you know the, the, the domestic Celtic getting ahead of steam and then all of a sudden it's, it's shut down because of an international break but I think it's captured the nation qualifying for this finals. It can only be good for our game. You know, I jumped. I was jumping about my living room like a kid with my three boys the other night when Scotland qualified. And you look at the reaction throughout the country. But these boys have not been to a finals, and a lot of them have been around about the, the Scotland team for quite a long time. So the buzz that they'll get off that, you know, coming back. Hopefully, the Celtic boys, and particularly, they, they, they benefit from that. They come back. First of all, with more game time in the, in the legs, but the buzz of just getting the, the nation to a finals. Uh, so I, I think it's only a good thing. I think they'll come oh, back. Definitely. And I think you know, the game, it's a great one at the weekend against Hibs. It's a good one to go into. Uh, nice pitch through there. And I think the boys are on form. I think we'll get a result. I always remember a game at Easter Road uh, that you starred in, Simon, and it was the game that you came up against Ray Wilkins, remember, at Easter Road. And I think Ray Wilkins had a few uh, words of advice in your ear as well after that game. You seem to do well at Easter Road. Are, are there certain stadiums that just suit certain players? The, the, see, for me, looking back, if you look at back at my goals, Hibs and Aberdeen seem to be popular 
a bonus yeah. for me in terms of scoring. But I love playing at Easter Road. I, I made my debut there. So I've got a kind of fond memory of, of going there. Obviously, it's a lot different nowadays. It's a, a lot more modern, but uh, I like going there. But yeah, certainly games like the Hibs game and the Aberdeen game, you know, they're, they're ones that kind of stick in my mind. Probably just because I, I scored more against them than, than any other teams. You know, when as Celtic fans, we're looking at the transfer window, for example, Simon, and as I was saying before, Colin and I, the rest of the team were covering every um, rumour and every confirmed signing. We came out the other end. I felt a lot stronger, actually. Now, I know we didn't get Fraser Foster. That would have been nice to get Fraser Foster. Uh, but going back to your point about the international games, the two guys that have come in for a lot of criticism recently have been Edward and Shane Duffy at the back. Now, there's no way these guys turn into bad players overnight, Simon. Do you think that they can turn it around? Because I think it's key, particularly in Shane Duffy's um, side, it's key that these guys start playing like we know they can play. Do you think they can turn it around for Celtic? I think, well, Odds, Oddson's showed over the, the, the time he's been at Celtic, you know, he's just out of sorts a wee bit, you know, he's got the goals for, for France the other night that you're hoping brings the confidence back. I think somebody touched on it during the week, the middle game when he came on, although he, he, he assists for one of the goals, it looks as if he's maybe just at that place where he's trying too hard, you know, he's maybe trying to do too much. So the, the goals will give him a lift. In terms of Shane Duffy, I think Lenny taking him out of the team probably helped him. You know, I, th- I think he probably needed that. You know, he's, he's come in there, he's scored a couple of goals and then he's found it really difficult since to find any form, you know. And I think he's probably realising now what it's like to play with Celtic. It's a totally different kettle of fish to anyone else. He's played the fact that he's a huge Celtic fan. Maybe he's been that kind of pressure on himself as well. So... I think it was good management from from Lenny to take him out against Motherwell and, and give him a, a little rest and let him just sit and, and, and take it in uh, before he comes back in. Whether he comes back in at weekend, we'll have to wait and see. But it's not easy coming. To, it's not easy playing for Celtic. You know, it, it, there's massive expectation and mistakes that have maybe made at other clubs, especially in this season as well. You know, so maybe just all that together, he's found it a wee bit difficult of late. But as you say, you don't become a bad player overnight. He's played in the English Premiership. He probably just needs a wee step out to assess it and then come back in. Colin, um, Simon says there that you know Shane Duffy might come back in to the, the team at the weekend. Would you play Shane Duffy? Would you marry him up with Chris Ayer? I think that's probably the back two that you would go with. Um looking at the options that we've got there because when you look at Beaton alongside Ayer it worked well at Motherwell but I'm not sure if it was something that we'd go to on a permanent basis again Beaton's going to have played three games for Israel over the, the, the course of time that he'd been away mm-hmm. Ayer's actually been um, in the I say this in the, the nicest of terms he's been in the fortunate position where he's not actually played any games after he got injured there uh, uh, away to Motherwell um, Norway's games get called off because of the coronavirus so he's not actually played his back we're very lucky that we've got him cleared him and Elanousi cleared for the weekend so it'd be good to see them both in the squad I personally have them both in my starting lineup. Duffy kind of needed that time to get his confidence back he seems to have done well for Ireland the England game being the exception but yeah I would probably go with Iron Duffy just because they're more of a natural pairing at the back Simon how uh, impressed I know that you some of your best performances you had a great partnership obviously with your pal Jackie uh, behind you but um, how impressed have you been with Jeremy Frimpong I know that you've seen his early performances last season um, he takes some kind of abuse physically on the park he's probably the most fouled Celtic player uh, but people go on about maybe defensively he needs to work on that final ball but we, we might forget just how young he is Simon Yeah well I think uh I covered a lot of the games for Celtic TV last last year and he was one that came into the team huge excitement you know taking players on taking players out you know, cause you can get into the line. I liked the way he lifted his head picking players out uh, and he set the standards really high for himself and I think again sometimes you know you get to your, your second season and, and people know what you're about a wee bit and you've, he's got mm. to adapt to it and there's maybe been a wee bit of criticism on the back of how good he came into the team. But 
the, the kid's starting his career. He's got pace to burn. As I say, he's an exciting player for me. I know, I know people always refer back to defensive duties, but I think that's more about his, his size than anything else. You know, uh, I don't really remember him being found wanting a great amount of times for Celtic. But he's certainly a player that I like. Eight, nine times out of ten, Celtic are going to be going forward. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's fantastic at that. Absolutely. Now, there's some questions and uh, comments coming in. Simon, Kevin Graham reminds us that you were in the squad the last time Scotland qualified for uh, major finals back in 98, just after obviously stopping the 10. I mean, how many players were in the squad from Celtic? Was it eight? Eight players? I think there was eight. I think there was, eight. I think there was seven initially, and then Jonathan Gould was drafted in. Uh, I think Andy Gorham pulled out in the States, and I think Gouldy became the eighth member of our squad, which... Again, just for me, a fantastic experience. That I remember us coming back for that uh, Sport in Lisbon game that we were obliged to play right after winning the league. And I think we were coming through security and everybody was getting text one by one. You were in, Darren Jackson was in, Jack, and we were kind of filtering through the squad. It was, a, it was a really good moment that I remember because... You were wanting all your teammates, you were wanting yourself in, obviously you were looking for your name, but you were wanting all your teammates in as well. And It was a good reflection on that, that season, as I say, eight of us went to, to France. Oh, absolutely it was. I mean, see what happens as well, Simon, is the after effect of that is there's there's a real um, added interest in the international game. Colin had a good discussion before we came on about how, you know, you see a lot of kids running about with messy tops and all that, English football tops on. Um, how important is it for even just the youth who are interested in football for us to have our own heroes, you know, John McGinn, Ryan Christie, guys like Lyndon Dykes, um, a namesake up front. How important is that for, for the youngsters coming through? It's massive. It's massive. You see, you see it in every sport. You know, Andy Murray with the tennis, and that would have reflected on kids coming through there. If it's a golfer, or, but me growing up, I was used to Scotland qualifying for World Cups and finals. You know, I was spoiled. And eighty two was the first one I remember, and I don't remember us missing out in too many. You know, ninety four we missed out, but not too many. Uh, and you get used to that, and you want to aspire to play for your country and play at World Cups and that's what I remember as a kid and there's been generations since that I've missed out on that you know as I say I touched on earlier on I've got three, kids, three boys myself and they've not experienced Scotland being at a finals they've, they've heard me talk about it and they've seen the videos but they've not experienced it and there's so many kids like that and the next generation coming through who will take huge uh, confidence from that into their game and, and that's their dreams they want to play for their clubs they want to play for their country you want to put I mean I wanted to play a World Cup uh, and in my head at 7, 8, 9 year old on the street I was playing in the World Cup final so all these kids now you're right rather than the Messi and Ronaldo's hopefully they do look at their team now that have achieved this and got to the Euro finals and, and it kicks them on it certainly gives I've looked at social media over the last week uh, it certainly gave everybody a lift connected to this country. Oh, without a doubt. Even there's a few guys on our uh, panel, Simon, who don't have an interest in the Scottish national team. But I mean, obviously that that subject has crept into our discussions over the last couple of weeks because people do get caught up in it. And I think it's great. I remember back to the World Cup 1990 and then you had obviously the Euros in 96. Uh, and of course, the one you were involved in. Now, I can't speak about the Scotland team without mentioning uh, Andy Robertson because we're talking about heroes and I mean that's a proper boys own heroes story uh, the way that he went about um, his business after being freed from Celtic Simon and I know I've spoke to you before about this obviously yourself and Jackie McNamara played a part in his development I mean I must give you a, a huge sense of pride as well you were involved fairly early on in his development from Queen's Park to Dundee United yeah, well, for me it was a small part, and Andy, Andy did most of that himself. You know, by taking the setback at Celtic and, and using it to his advantage in terms of just wanting to succeed and his will to succeed. And you're right. I mean, that, for me, that's the best part of not. I mean, playing is the best part in football, and coaching 
there's good, good and bad, as I've experienced, but seeing kids like that come through, and particularly Andy taking his, his second chance, you know, starting at Queen's Park, he was with us at United for a year, and then just going to a different stratosphere. You know, he's now a Champions League winner, mm-hmm. a Premier League winner. He's captain in the country to the, the finals. It's it's a fantastic story and a, a total credit to, to the boy himself. And I'm, I'm not surprised, you know, the way he went about his business at Dundee United, I'm not surprised he's achieved everything that he has went on to do because he's worked so hard for it. You know, he's he's put his, his mind to it after that setback and it would have been easy for him after Celtic just to get a head down and think, it's, it's not for me. But, you know, he bounced back and took his opportunity. It's, it's, it's similar to Ryan Christie, you know, uh, in terms of getting your chance and taking it. You know, Ryan could quite easily have slid out of the Celtic picture, you know, mm. after not not starting particularly well and getting, getting loaned out to Aberdeen and maybe just you know, thinking that's going to be where, no disrespect to Aberdeen, that's where I'm going to play. Uh, but got his chance when he came back to Celtic and hasn't he looked back? You see during the week there when, uh, I mean, the goal obviously was just sublime. It was uh, typical Ryan Christie, but then afterwards with the interview and the sheer emotion of that right. and what follows right. that, Simon, it takes it takes Ryan Christie to another level. Before you know it, Liam Gallagher's tweeting about Ryan Christie and Primo Screen as very, well. I was jealous. <laughs> oh, it was brilliant. That. Eh? that was superb. How important is it for Celtic to try and tie him down on a new deal? I think he is uh, unlosable uh, to the Celtic side. He's pivotal. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. I think uh, they have to tie him down uh, and make sure he, he stays on because he has, he's, he's a huge player for, for Celtic. And I like the fact that Rogic is back in the fold <laughs> as well because he's of that similar style. You know, he can take the ball in, in tight areas and, and open things up. But Christie's been doing that for the last season and a half as well when Tom, for whatever reason, through injuries, found himself out. But I think Rogic is looking stronger as well so I think you can't have enough of these guys these creative players that will win a game for you you know with one bit of one bit of magic so it's important that they they do tie him up because again when he's performing on an international level as well people people will be watching so it's it's important to to get him on a, a longer contract Oh, absolutely. One final question from myself anyway, Colin. You get yourself lined up <laughs> if you have any, any left. You mentioned something earlier, and it was all the mitigating circumstances around Celtics, maybe um, unspectacular start to the season. And one of the things you mentioned there I find very interesting is the no fans. Now, it's interesting that you look at the Sparta Prague game, the big European night at Celtic Park, Simon, you played in some yourself. And we as Celtic fans always pride ourselves on this uh, famous atmosphere that's created in, in the stadium. Do you think it hits a team like Celtic more than some others? Uh, I think that, yes, because of the, the, the following, the amount of supporters, you know. So, for example, I'm. I covered the St Myrne game uh, through at St Myrne Park on Celtic TV. It was the first game that I'd actually got to uh, to experience this no fans, and it was it was like a training pitch, um, training match. There was no atmosphere. The players had to generate it for themselves, and I'm thinking normally behind that goes full of Celtic. Behind that goes full of Celtic. It's noise. And it does. It does. If you're if you're not performing to your the best, it sometimes does lift you, you know. And I think from that, I think every club will be affected in their own way with this no fans thing. But from Celtic's perspective, it's the amount of fans. And you're quite right with the, the European games. I've played in them. I've been there at other ones. I was there the night Tony Watt scored with my son, and the place was actually shaking. I've played in these games where you can feel it from the from the. Uh, the stands and it lifts you and for that not to be there it must be so difficult for these boys you know they know the importance of the season but you haven't to generate it yourself and it's it's got to play a factor oh definitely I would think so Colin what's your thoughts 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, we spoke about this before we came on the air. We're saying how uh, the virtual season ticket was our, our pass to paradise for this season. And um, for me, I'm not sure we've kind of had the same impact as what we would have um, been in the stadium. Even watching it, we've, we've spoke about how we're behind on the streams. It's like 45 seconds behind. Um, but it still gives you that sense of being there, just hearing the commentary, just seeing it. It's, it's as close as we're going to get for the the next while but I think it's definitely having an impact on the players I know for the pre-season games they sort of piped through some crowd noise um, but that seemed to kind of die off towards the end there as well Um, but do you know what hopefully things will start to make a turnaround now we're starting to see um we're starting to see signs of a, a vaccine coming. Um, we're starting to see talks down south that they're looking to introduce fans into the grounds before Christmas. Hopefully we won't be too far behind that. And um, I don't know about you, Simon, but I'm just desperate for the day that those turnstiles open back up again and we can get back in and pay for the overpriced pies and juice. <laughs> the, the, only good, the only good thing about the fans not being there just now is how everybody's going to feel when we're back in. You know, it's going to... Something that you've maybe just taken for granted over the years. Now, I think every fan will appreciate the actual match day experience of getting in there and celebrating goals and the noise because nobody ever thought this was going to get taken away. I've never in a million years would you believe that you know we were playing a season with, with no fans there. No. Uh, so I think we will... I think everybody will appreciate everything a wee bit more after this, to be honest. Oh, without a doubt, Simon. I know you're a big music fan, and obviously the music industry's been hit. The live music um, circuit is dying on its knees at the minute. Um, but going back to the gin, so we've had a comment in there. Someone was commenting saying it would be great to have a Tom Boyd gin. I actually think Boyd's more of a, a Chianti. He's more of a mature <laughs> wine, isn't he? The ambassador, Simon. Yeah? The ambassador, yes. Yeah, and he, I think Tom likes a red wine as well. Good man. Uh, listen, we, we, we've started that. This is a bit of fun with the four guys. Uh, hopefully, they'll go well. Maybe, maybe further down the line, we can build a squad. You know, I think the good thing with gin is it's quick to make, and you mm-hmm. can you can experiment with the flavours. You know, it's not like whiskies that have to sit there for a duration or a period of time. Uh, we can be quite creative with it as well. And yeah, the ambassador gin's got a good. Ring to it. <laughs> watch, play, watch this space. Now, tell us where we can get this. We're going to give these out um, as prizes, Simon. All that the Celtic State of Mind listeners need to do is subscribe to us on YouTube and we'll give one of these bottles away this week and one next week as well. Macaveni and Sutton. Where can yeah. people buy these for Christmas gifts? It's, it's on our, our, our events company, so it's first star. Uh, so you'll get that on any of our social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook or Twitter, and there's a Shopify link on that. Uh, We are hoping to go to one of the shopping centres, you know, in the lead up to Christmas, but that has kind of been put on hold, obviously, with the announcements yesterday. Uh, So, again, we'll steer people towards that on our platforms if, if we can get that to happen. But at the moment, it's on our, our Shopify link on all our social media platforms. And Simon, I've got to ask you, of the four, which one's your favourite? <laughs> well, do you know something? I've only, I've got four bottles and I've only sampled the Machiavelli so far. So when they were <laughs> tweaking, the, when we did the taste night, they were tweaking things. So I think Sutty's started as something and finished as our raspberry and lime I think have you got what's it on there yep the that's raspberry, raspberry and, lime. and lime gin so that started off as something else and we tweaked it and the Mialbe one was the same so the the, the Maca one's the original kind of like your London original you know so mm-hmm. that's why we went for Maca uh, and that's the only one I've actually sampled yet so I'll need to go with Macca then now. <laughs> oh, good man. Good man. Now, Simon, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you again on A Celtic State of Mind. Uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. But if not, enjoy your Christmas and stay safe. Thank you very much for joining us today. You too, guys. Take care. Nice Take one. Care, Thanks, Sid. Thank you. Cheers. 